We, um, we're excited. This is the first time in a very long time uh, that we've had VBS. And, and so we know that a lot of you guys uh, want to get your kids signed up. Why is she telling you it's open? Because we only have slots for 100 kids. And, and so we're opening it up to you to make sure that all of our kids are registered. And then the remainder is well, you're, it's going to be your friends. So your friends, uh, maybe your family who you would like to get signed up, you got to get them signed up uh, in the next two weeks and of course, if those slots are taken up, well, then we won't open it up publicly. Uh, but if there's something left, we're going to open it up. So very exciting. Uh, you know what? I love Pastor G and all that she's doing and, and her heart for our kids. As you guys are coming in today, of course, if you watch the news and you're not living under a stone, you saw what happened uh, last night. I thought that it was very strange and very odd, but I, I, I came in from working in the house and we see uh, that Iran has... I launched a drone attack on Israel. And then, of course, we saw the response. And you know, the word of God tells us, blessed are those who bless the nation of Israel and cursed are those who curse the nation of Israel. Uh, the, everything that we see in the end times prophetic, it's not revolving around the United States. It's revolving around them. And I thought that it would be appropriate for us today to pray for the nation of Israel, for all of those that are there, uh, and pray for... Uh, the prime minister, to be able to know what is the proper response. And then, of course, pray for God's will. I, I've asked Julie and, and Sam Hatfield, if you guys could come up, I've asked them to come and lead us in a time of prayer for the nation of Israel, for the response, because we don't know what that is yet, but we're praying because, you know, when, when, when we see what happened last night, we now know that Iran is not just battling through a proxy war through these various organizations, but now you hear the news organizations, well, this is serious. And so I feel like we need to pray, and I felt like it would be appropriate for you guys to do so. Sure. It's interesting. We didn't know that we were going to do this, and uh, I'll tell you a quick story. We have a business where we have an opportunity to talk to actually people from all over the world. And, um, and two or three months ago, I had a couple come into our store, they were buying something, they come up. And if I get a chance, I talk to people and try to make them feel comfortable and welcome to the city. And, and so after talking to them a minute, I could tell they were maybe, you know, from maybe the Middle East or whatever. So I asked them, I said, where, where are you guys from as they were leaving? And they said, we're from Israel. I said, you're Jewish? And they said, yes. And there was almost a hesitation of telling me that. And I said, let me tell you something. God is with you. I am with you. And the nation of America is with you. And I can tell you, when I said that, there was like a, such an acceptance and a relief and a thankfulness on their faces when I said that. So when Pastor Brian asked us just a moment ago just to pray, uh, Julie and I were listening this morning to some things, and there was a word talked about, <clears throat> let's pray just like Daniel did. Remember what Daniel did? He faced the Jerusalem. Do you remember that? And he prayed for Jerusalem. So this morning, wherever direction that is, in your minds, let's face Jerusalem and pray for the nation of Israel. Father God, we know that these people are called of you. We know that they are your chosen people is what your word says. But Father God, even more than that, you said whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father God, we speak that word over that nation right now, this morning, your word is alive, and let it come alive in that nation this morning like it never has before. Uh, 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 faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let them hear the word of God somewhere this morning in the nation of Israel. Father God, we pray for that protection. We pray for that security. We pray for wisdom. We pray for all of this over this nation this morning and those people in their houses as they gather, as they're with their families. And I can just imagine the fear, but Father God, we speak to the fear and we replace it with faith. 
We replace it with the word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ over that nation that you have called, that they, you have called those people your people. And Father God, we just speak that this morning in the name of Jesus. Bless Israel today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, God. You know, I'm amazed at, 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 at where we are and what we're doing and what we're seeing. And let me just tell you that even right here in our own nation, we're beginning to see people wake up to the fact that there is something big going on. And, and, and we, we see all that, that, that there is and we think, man, where are we and what's happening? And, and you know what, as you can see, you can put my, my message title up there. The question that's asked is what does the world need now? And I would imagine that, you know, the, the disciples, when they were with Jesus Christ, on the day that he ascended, they were probably asking themselves that very question. Where do I do now? Where do we go? What is expected what, what are we supposed to do now? And, and Jesus laid it out for them. And then he, te- he said, I'm not only going to give you a responsibility, but I'm going to give you the authority to carry out those responsibilities. And, and you know what? What does the world need now? And it's not about what they want, but it's about what they need. And what I'm seeing is we're seeing revivals pop up. Remember, it was just a year ago where there was a college campus where revival had taken place. They started a prayer meeting, and that prayer meeting didn't stop for two weeks. That's a long prayer meeting. So we plan on having revival here today, and this service is going to go on for two weeks, right? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But, you know, something similar has happened in Georgia because it doesn't look like anything that we think that it should look like. And the very reason that people were attracted to Jesus was because it didn't look like anything that they were used to. Because what they were used to was letting them down. What they were used to, they could not live up to. It was almost, it was out of their reach. We're going to do what we have to do as Jews. We're going to do what we have to do in the Jewish community. But we will never be able to obtain the, the height that these Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priests of that day, the people that are running the temple, the people that are worshiping in the temple, will never be able to obtain that. And then Jesus came in and he messed everything up. He said, the truth doesn't look anything like what you think it should look like. As a matter of fact, it's not about what you see, but it's about who I am and who I want you to be. And I came across this great article on uh, on a news organization, and I wanted to share this article with you because I think that it goes right to the heart of the fact that people are still to this day looking for something different. They're looking for something that's real. Something that can change their lives. Something that can change the course of their life. Something that can pull them out of, of, of obscurity to give them purpose, to give them a plan. Even the people that, are, that seem to have their act together, there's still a sense of, of brokenness, of depression. There's still a sense of, of worry. And, and, and it doesn't matter how much money you have, you still go to sleep with the same concerns. And they want to be able to go to sleep without those concerns. They want, to, they want to be able to wake up and not have to worry about the things that they worry about. And so Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to step in and we're going to do something different. I happen to see this headline. It says, college students get baptized in pickup trucks. And then it says, colon, and in quotations, it says, Jesus is more powerful than brokenness. University of Georgia students, where are you at? That's what I'm saying. Listen, it's happening, right? University of Georgia students gave their lives to Christ earlier in April. This is a national news organization. This is not Christian news. This is found on Fox News. University of Georgia students give their lives to Christ earlier in April after being baptized in pickup trucks in a parking lot. Unite Georgia, that's an organization, brought together thousands of Gen Zers for worship, prayer, and personal testimonies. Some students were so moved by the prayer service that they decided to get baptized in the bed of pickup trucks nearby. This, This one student said, I just heard the call from the Lord, and he said, be obedient. 
This, this fellow, his name is Nate Kearns, a junior who was baptized, told the, the Ingram, Ingram, I listened to him to take a step of faith and let my fraternity brothers watch that. Kern said that he grew up culturally in the Christian faith. Now, this is what's crazy. He grew up in the Christian faith, possibly just in a church just like this one. I grew up in the Christian faith, but he didn't have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, and he felt a call to respond to the Lord. And he says, no matter how broken you think you are, Jesus Christ's love is more powerful than that. Then he wants to enter into a personal relationship with you. If you call in the name of the Lord, you will not be forsaken, he said. Unite U.S. founder Tanya Pruitt said that, that, that the, the event can only be explained by the work of God. We have thousands of students showing up at these events, hundreds giving their lives to Jesus, hundreds getting baptized, and it's like, what is the draw? You know what, if I were to open it up right now and say, and take a picture of our baptismal, although I love it and I am appreciative of it, and, and say, we, we're ready, we're ready, we've already got several people that are signed up to be baptized in just a couple of weeks. But there's something about that, that, that raw, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ, what do I do now? And, and all of a sudden, there's a couple of rednecks that show up with a, with a, with a truck bed with a tarp in it filled with water. What, what, get, what, what, what is going through their mind? Well, you know what, what they've experienced and what they've had, it's let them down. Or it, it hasn't been effective. They want something real. They want something that they can apply to their everyday life, just like you do. And you know what, surprisingly enough, even what we do here at times can look very familiar. And we, I'm not saying that we're religious, but we can get religious. It's very easy to fall into the trap of religion. That the pastor is supposed to look a certain way, that the worship leader is supposed to sing a certain way, certain songs, right? And we've had that, that the church is supposed to look a certain way. And, and in the end, none of that matters when somebody is hurting, somebody is lost, somebody needs forgiveness, somebody is riddled with guilt and shame, and they're just looking for freedom. And somebody comes along and says, here's Jesus. He frees you from your sin. He frees you from your troubles. Give your life to him. And then listen, come get baptized in the back of my truck. And people do it because they, they, they begin to see that there is truth to this. Now, listen, yes, we, we, we turn to go to places like this to be discipled, to grow, and for our families to grow, and for some sense of, uh, of, of security and, and a sense of, of normality. No, no doubt that we still, but I still want to live on the edge of I don't want to get religious I don't want to be religious. As a matter of fact, I want to see the miraculous. And let me just tell you, that was the draw to Jesus. That's why so many people came to Jesus. Because he was something different. He was offering something different than what they had known. And not only was he offering them the truth, then he was healing their sick. They saw miracles, signs and wonders. The, 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 the very things that people hoped for, they began to see. I want to show it, and even Jesus said this. It, 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 I read it to you last week. I'm going to read this scripture to you again. It's found in Luke chapter 24. And then we're going to read a little bit in the book of Acts. And I am preparing you for what I believe is going to be our own revival as a church as we surrender our lives to the different, to something that's different, something that isn't offered. And I want you to see this. It says, then he, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you. You remember me reading this to you last week. He said, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, concerning the Son of God. And he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scriptures. Up until this time, they weren't comprehending the scriptures. But Jesus opened their understanding so that they could. And then he said to them, thus it is written, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and, and to rise from the dead on the third day. And, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are witnesses to these things, he says. And then he said, behold, I send the promise, capital P, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. 
And then, of course, we see, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And now it came to pass that, that while he blessed them, that he parted from them and, 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 carried, and was carried, and they, they carried him to heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Why? Because they, there was something different. It didn't look like what they were used to. It didn't look quite like what was, man, this guy was raising the dead, healing blind eyes, opening deaf ears, healing the lame. This guy, Jesus, was casting out demons. They saw it. They experienced it. This guy, Jesus Christ, died, was put into a tomb and rose again. This guy now looked at them and said, I have something prepared for you. I'm going to send the promise to you because my miracles don't stop here. My, my salvation for mankind doesn't stop here and so they went and they waited and what happened in the book of acts the the author luke who wrote the book of luke also wrote the book of acts he was a physician he wasn't one of the apostles wasn't one of the disciples he was a physician but he wrote he was there he walked with them he saw things and and again they he reiterated the the very things that that are spoken of in his gospel In verse 1, it says the former account. I'm teaching today, so I'm going to read a lot of the Word of God. The former account I made, O Theophilus, he's writing this letter to a gentleman named Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which that he was taken up, after through the, the Holy Spirit had come, had given commandments to the apostles whom he gave, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive. After his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together, it says, the Holy Spirit is, is what? Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. The promise again capitalized because he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, the adorable Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said, which he said, you, you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And you're going to notice that this is the beginning of the miracles, the signs and the wonders that happened in the book of Acts. We read those things and we think, where are they now? Where is it? We have tried to, we've tried to compartmentalize who we are in the Christian faith. And believe it or not, there are people that come here that come from other denominations or other religions, and they love it, the fact that, that we aren't as religious. But believe it or not, there are people that are born in this. There are people that have been coming that feel like we're just as religious as what they're coming out of. Because we do the same things. We have a service, and that service goes a certain way, and we do the certain things. We have prayer, and it's prayed a certain way. And man, we can become very religious in what we do. And he said, man, I am not giving the world religion. The promise that I have is not to just redefine religion. As a matter of fact, I came to set men free from religion. Religion isn't going to heal you. It's not going to save you. It's not going to, 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 you won't see the miraculous signs and wonders because of a religion. Every now and then we hear of a statue that might be crying blood and everybody runs to it because everybody wants signs and wonders. Signs and wonders should happen right here. It should happen as you pray for your family, as you pray for your friends, as you pray for your coworkers, as you speak to people that come into your place of business. That's where the Holy Spirit should change lives. We come and we hope. You know, my goodness, I would hope that if you're sick on Thursday, you're not waiting until Sunday to get prayed for. Or even worse than that, you you get sick on Monday, you got to wait a whole week. We've got to get to the place where we expect God to do the unusual, where we expect God to do the miraculous, where we anticipate a move of God to the place where people might pray and then get saved and then want to get baptized in the back of your truck. Pastor Brian Nelson's like, Pastor Brian, I guess I need to carry a tarp around in the back of my truck now. Yes. Just make sure that the truck isn't moving when people are in there getting <laughs> baptized. That's what Nelson would do. 
Because people are desperate. They were desperate in the book of Acts. After the Holy Spirit moved, Philip literally was transported into a chariot. Inside of that chariot was an Ethiopian eunuch reading in the book of Isaiah. Philip then looks at him and says, I see what you're reading. And the guy's probably like, how'd you get here? But as he's reading, Philip begins to open his eyes the way Jesus opened their eyes to the truths of the scripture. And here's what's funny. After he discovers that, that he's reading about Jesus, that Isaiah wrote that scroll. And on that scroll, 700 years before Jesus would even come on the scene, then his eyes are open to that, the fact that Jesus fulfilled that scripture. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. Then he looked at Philip and he's like, here's some water. Can we just stop here can I get baptized now no uh man we got to wait until the pastor fills up the baptism pool at the church and we got to sing songs and we got to have a message and then you can get baptized Philip said no yeah man right now right here let's get out and they baptize him right then and there. Why? Because the when, when people come to the knowledge of who Jesus is they want to respond immediately. Now, what helps us to bring that, to give that, to share that, how do we do that? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's through the wonderful working power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to share the truth in love with people that need to hear it. The question is, have you experienced it? Jesus looked at them and said that you've been baptized in the baptism of John, but I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Is that just for the disciples? Was that just for then? Is that something that only happened so that we can read about it in the beginning of the book of Acts? Or is that something that we can enjoy today? Is there a separate baptism from the baptism in water for you and I today? Is there a gift today that is separate and subsequent from salvation that says we can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I believe personally that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are filled with the Spirit. You are filled with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Paul says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But that's the Spirit coming in us. I believe in this moment, as God opened their eyes to the Scriptures, as they accepted Him as the Son of God, that, that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that, but something else happened on the day of Pentecost. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not the, the Spirit living in me. It's me swimming in the Spirit. Do you catch the difference? It's not the Holy Spirit filling me. It's me. That's what baptism is. The word baptism means immersed. That's why we baptize the way that we do in water. We immerse. And man, I know Pastor G is showing the kids today a video because we've got several kids that are wanting to get baptized. And, and, and so she's showing them and helping them understand why we immerse. Pastor Brian, I was baptized as a child. So was I. But that was my parents' decision. That was not my decision. After I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I wanted people to know that I made that decision for myself. And I wasn't sprinkled, I was immersed. And that's what baptism means. And so if Jesus is speaking of a new baptism, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, then what does that mean? He is, that means that we can be immersed in the Holy Spirit. And from there we go out and have prayer meetings. And people are giving their lives to Jesus Christ on the college campuses. People are giving their lives to Jesus Christ because they are scared of what they see on the news about what's happening in the Middle East. But for some reason, you're confident that everything is going to be okay. And when you share the faith, your faith, and you share with them who you are in Jesus Christ, it's because the power of the Holy Spirit has endued you with power to be his witness. And so he promised them this. And they immediately go. 
And, and, and they begin to pray and they go and they wait. And then all of a sudden, they, it, it, while they're praying in the middle of all of that, they choose Matthias to be the apostle to take Judas's place because Judas, man, after he sold Jesus out, he went and hung himself. And they had to replace Judas. They replaced Judas. Then they get back to doing what Jesus Christ called them to do. They went back into Jerusalem, into an upper room, and they began to pray for what Jesus said, I want you to pray and wait for. And then we see it happen. In chapter 2, verse 1, this is a particular day. Not This is actually a Jewish uh, holiday that they celebrated, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, here's what I want you to know. There were thousands upon thousands of Jews that were there doing their Jewish duty, doing things like they always do, celebrating the way they always celebrate with the hopes of something it could be different, something could be real. And so there were thousands of them. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came the sound of, from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire. And one sat upon each of them. There was visual things that were happening. There were audio th things that, that they could hear. They, the, the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And as they prayed, this tongue of fire appeared above all of their heads. This isn't just Old Testament miracle stuff. There are powerful things that happen even after Jesus Christ descended into heaven. And they were praying the way that Jesus said. They got together. They were all in one accord praying. And one accord means that they were praying unanimously. They were praying together. They didn't even know what they were praying for. They didn't know what to expect. Jesus said, go and wait. So they were waiting and they were praying. And all of a sudden, the, the miraculous started happening. In verse 4, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And, and when this sound occurred, when this sound occurred, in other words, they heard something that they had never heard before. They saw something that they had never seen before. There was something different that was being presented. What is this? Thousands of them, mind you. This wasn't just something that happened in a room with closed windows, closed doors. This was happening so that the public could experience it. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Many different dialects, many different languages were, were spoken by the different Jews that came together to worship on the day of Pentecost. And they were all amazed and they marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and, and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phry, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this stuff, God help me, Phrygia and, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitor, in other words, everybody, they're all hearing it. Verse 11, we, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. God. They heard it. This is strange. It's miraculous. This is something so miraculous that it cannot be explained. Do you hunger for the miraculous? Do you hunger for something that is more impactful than just a Sunday morning service, than, than just a Wednesday night service? Are you hungry to see God move in your life? Are you hungry to see the miraculous happen in your own home? Don't you want to believe that if, as I pray and as I pray for my children, I can believe that they're going to be protected when they go to school, that when I pray for healing over my loved one, that I believe that they can be healed in that moment. That when somebody needs Jesus Christ, I can speak to them about him. And they instantly give their lives to him, wanting to know where can I go and be baptized. 
We'd love to be able to lead somebody to the Lord right there in, 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 our, in our health club and have to use the pool to baptize him in that moment. It's like, God, uh, would they allow that? It's always easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. After it's done, what are they going to do? Kick you out? So be it. I mean, that is the key. But the enemy, man, he causes us to lose sight. We get drugged down into the mud. And then all of a sudden we have certain expectations. The church should look like this. The pastor should look like this. The worship should sound like this. Our kids' ministry should do things like this. And then we get so focused on that that we forget that there is power behind the one that we serve. Power in our lives. Power in our speech. Power in the way that we do things. Power in the places that we go. I mean, we're, the eternity doesn't start for us the moment that we stop breathing. Eternity starts for us the moment that we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. In verse 12, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocked. You'll still have the mockers. It said they're full of new wine. They're drunk. But Peter standing up with the 11 raised his voice and he said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words for these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he begins to tell him what was prophesied by Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone say all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I shall sow wonders in heaven above, signs on the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Now, this is not about the eclipse, folks. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, is how Sam prayed, shall be saved. Men of Israel, Peter said, Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst. And as you also know, him, be, uh, him being delivered by, uh, by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, you've crucified him, you put him to death, who God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Amen. And then he goes on to what David said. And in verse 29, go to verse 29 for me, Josh. He says this, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit at his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not that Jesus would physically sit in a throne in the temple in Jerusalem, but he would sit on the throne of God and he would call the nations unto himself. And what I want you to see as he goes through and he explains all of this, I want you to go down to the last verse that I want you to read in verse 46. After all of this, it said literally 3,000 men gave their lives to Jesus Christ. They saw it. They gave their lives to Jesus Christ. They were baptized. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple, because that's what they knew to do. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart because there was no longer the rules and regulations of how things were supposed to look, how religion was supposed to be, what they were supposed to do, all of a sudden breaking free from the traditions of what was supposed to be done. They broke bread 
with gladness in their hearts. Simplicity. We make things so complicated. We make things in our Christian walk, things that, man, you know, and then we start judging other people because they don't do it the way that we do it. They don't act the way that we act. They, they don't have sing the songs that we sing. They don't worship the way that we worship, and that pastor doesn't, doesn't do things the way that other pastors do. It just gets so silly when all the while the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us to promote Jesus Christ as the one that came to break you free from tra- tradition so that you would give your heart to Jesus Christ and desire to live for him. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I want to end it with this because I've just, as I prayed with our our prayer team that was here last Sunday, I said pray because I want to believe for people to desire and long for and want a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit would just fill them, but they would be baptized in, immersed in the Holy Spirit. Because I don't know about you, but I, I need the power from on high to not only be his witness, but in this point in time, just to live a Christian life. And so I, I'm just trying to whet your appetite. And I want to close with saying this, and these are the things that I'm going to bring up next week. So because they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, basically when Jesus looked at his disciples and said, it's better for me to go to heaven. It's better for me to go and sit at the right hand of God than for me to stay here. Because as long as I'm here, I'm only one individual and all of these things are done through me and the people that I am able to pass this on to. But if I go to heaven, then the promise comes and now all of a sudden his spirit is poured out and will be poured out on all flesh. He looked at his disciples and he said, greater things will you do than I've done because I go to my father in heaven. And we look at the word of God and we read the book of Acts and Paul preaches such a long message somebody falls out the window, breaks their neck and dies. And he walks out and he brings that individual back to life and probably went up and finished that long sermon. There was a, there was a man who had been sitting at the gate called beautiful. He's been lame all of his life. And as Peter and John passed, Peter says the famous words, silver and gold, have I none, but what I do have, I give to you. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. We see Cornelius, a a, a complete non-Jewish individual, the first Gentile, to be filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit, to be saved. To the amazement of all the Jews, because we thought that this was reserved just for Jews. We see the miraculous. We see demons being cast out. It says Peter's shadow was healing people as he passed them. Do you know what the world needs today? The world doesn't need another message. It doesn't need another church. It it doesn't need what we have a tendency. It doesn't need another Bible study. The world needs the power of God. They need the visible and audible power of God moving in your community, in this community. The power of God that releases people from demons, that releases people from spirits. The power of God that heals people of back pain, that heals people uh, of shoulder pain. The, The one who heals people of COVID and diseases. The one who can raise the dead. I I know, Pastor Brian, I haven't seen the dead raised here at Lakeshore. Listen, I'm longing for those days. 
I believe that miracles happen. And I believe that people have gotten prayer here and they've seen a miracle. There is no doubt in my mind that we see the miraculous happening, but it's going to happen on a larger scale because the world needs it desperately. They need to hear about a Savior who didn't die for them so that they can get right and then give their lives to Jesus Christ. We had a Savior that died for them that, that while they were still sinning, he gave them hope. Pastor Brian, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? What does that even look like? What does it mean? Listen, I grew up in a church that doesn't believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is something that we experience today. You know, and for those of you that have done any kind of study on it, there's big words that, that will describe those who believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit and those who don't. There are some who believe that once the apostles were finished writing the word of God, there was no longer any need for the, the, the power of God to be shown because the word of God is all that we need. Hey, while that's true, man, I hope it's, I hope it's not true. Cessationalist, non-cessationalist, I'm just going to tell you right now. Pastor Brian, do you speak in other tongues? I pray in other tongues. I pray in the spirit. You better believe it. I've been endued with power from on high to be his witness. I, I, I cherish that moment that I was and every moment to this day that I am. It's not just a one-time thing that happens. It's something that happens regularly. And he says, and Jesus himself said it, and Joel said it, this gift isn't just for you, but it's for your children and your children's children, for those that are here, for those that are far off, not just geologically, but in time. Today, I believe that, man, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is something that can happen for you and sometimes, man, we struggle in, in that moment. You know, every step that we take, I believe that baptism is a step that you take to get closer to God. And when you take that step, man, there's a new anointing that comes on your life. And all of a sudden, you're able to say things that you weren't able to say before, live in a way that you weren't able to live before. And let me just tell you, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, things changed for me. I begin to walk in the newness of faith to believe that God can do the miraculous, that, that God can and will do the miraculous, that God can, can, we can see signs and miracles and wonders today. Pastor Brian said, so you're one of those churches and you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can I come here if I don't believe that? Yes. We don't believe that it has anything to do with salvation. We believe that it is a gift that is given separate and subsequent to your salvation in Jesus Christ. However, don't try to have lunch with me every Friday to convince me that I'm wrong. Because it's not going to work. It's who I am and it's what I know. It's what drives me. And guess what? The Holy Spirit doesn't drive you to do the miracles. doesn't drive you to do wonders. The Holy Spirit drives you to Jesus Christ. It drives you to go deeper in your relationship with him, to trust him like you've never trusted him, to love him like you've never loved him, to expect the unexpected, to expect that miracle to happen, to expect to speak to people that you would never have an opportunity to speak to. And I just want you to know today that it's very real. And I know that this is just a teaching, and I'm about to pray, and there's no real response. I'm ready right now, Pastor Brian. Uh, I'm ready right now. Will you pray? Say, Lord God, if it's real, then I want to be baptized in your Holy Spirit. Can he do it if it's not at the church? He can do it in your shower. He can do it in your car. He can do it while you're cutting your grass. He can't do it while you're shopping on Amazon. I'm kidding. He can do it whenever he wants. And man, when he does, your life will change. I mean, isn't, isn't the cross enough? Isn't his resurrection enough? Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, I want you to go. Now that you have seen me alive, I want you to go and wait because I've got something else. But wait, there's more. And when they discovered it, it changed the course of history. Do you want what God has for you? Do you want what God says that you can have? I'm going to pray that God would start getting us to hunger so that we want more, that we want to see the Lord move. We want to see the people that we think are unsavable 
run to Jesus Christ and get baptized in your hot tub. And you don't have to wait for you to fill up your truck. I mean, we, that's what I'm believing. The people are going to get saved. They're going to go, and man, they're going to want to get baptized in the pool at the local health club. They're going to, they're, they're, man, they're just desperate because Jesus is moving in a way that you and I don't expect him to move. Doing things that we would have never expected him to do. We just have to make ourselves available. And we have to be endued with power from on high. I will endue you with power from on high when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be desperate for more of you. To never get to the place where we are satisfied with our own Christian living. With the way that church looks or the songs that we sing or the the parking lot that's paved or the air conditioning in the building. Or the VBS, Lord God, that, that's there provided. I'm praying, Lord, <clears throat> that in our heart of hearts, we would desire more than all of that. And Lord, when we come together, we would look for opportunities to be endued with power from on high so that we will experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit that's spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The, the prophetic gift, the gift of faith, the gift of miracles and signs and wonders, the gift of healing, the, the gift, Lord God, even of tongues and the interpretation of those tongues. It's in the Word of God. It's in your Word. And so, Lord God, we desire it because that's what the world needs now. The world doesn't need faith in an organization or in a way of doing things, the world needs the truth. The world needs your power. The power of forgiveness and salvation. Lord God, the power to do the supernatural. And so Lord God, I'm here, and I may be the only pastor praying this on the North Shore, but so be it. Lord God, here at Lake Shore, so goes the leader, so goes the organization. And all I know is that this leader wants to see the miraculous. This leader wants to see your hand move. I want to see people in this congregation who aren't just inviting people to church, but they are winning people to you right there in, in their cubicle, on their campuses. Lord God, out in the field. I don't know what it is that they do, but I'm praying, Lord God, that you would give us the desire to say, surely there must be more. And then, Lord God, I'm praying that, that they would experience the very things that I've experienced after what I know and believe is a moment that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm praying, Lord God, that you would give us a hunger and a thirst Lord God, we would, we would be drawn to your word. We would discover who you are, discover what you desire of us. And Lord, fall more deeply in love with you. Because what the world needs now is the same thing that the world needs. When you came into the world, the world needs a savior. The world needs a savior. And then the power, the supernatural power that follows when, Lord God, we surrender to you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Hey, once again, we want to say thanks for joining us. Uh, our prayer is that you felt the presence of God, that you allowed him to speak to you uh, through today's message. But we want you to know that if you need to contact us, you can do that at lakeshorechurch.life. If you gave your life to Jesus Christ today because of today's message, I would love for you to contact us here at Lakeshore. Give us your address. Uh, let us send you some information. I would even love to send you a Bible. Call us, contact us, email us, some kind of a way get in touch with us. If you'd like to give to our ministry, you can also find out how to do that at our website, lakeshorechurch.life. We pray that this is an incredibly blessed week for you, for your family, and uh, we'd love to see you join us again. But until the next time, God bless, and uh, we'll see you then.